to the Cross Along Podcast. My name is Carlos Smith, and today we are in Burbank, California, with another special episode. We have the founder of Brilliant Girl and Black Girl Productions, Miss Shanisha, Do- Shanisha Dotson. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing very well. We appreciate you. Like I said, I, I reached out to you like prior to us coming out here. I'm just saying I would love, you know, I saw your story on blackbusiness.com and I was like, I would love to, you know, you know, having a black owned um, Barbie dolls um, um, production company as well. That's so important, especially with the representation of dolls, because I have two daughters and I think that's very important. So for you to, um, you know, start that business and keep it going, I was like, I would love to have you on. And thankfully you took the time to, you know, to respond and, you know, be willing to share your story today. All right. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So kind of starting out, can you tell us where, where are you from? Well, originally I'm from Arkansas, born okay. and raised. How was, how was, you know, growing up in Arkansas? Like I, I've never been there before, but, you know, I, um, of course, I'm pretty sure it's like, in, you know, the South is like a, it's a little bit different. So how, how was it in, you know, growing up in Arkansas? Arkansas is very slow. It's like one of the places where everybody knows everybody. So Mm -hmm. I grew up in a small town called Lone Oak. And in Lone Oak, I had some of the same teachers as my mom had. So it was just very small. Everybody knows the family name. Everybody knows everybody's business. Just a small place. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like you know being from South Carolina. Where, where I'm from is a very small town in Jonesville. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody knows everybody. We got we have three lights in our whole town, mm-hmm. but you know it was like a close knit family. But like of course South Carolina is to me, it's a lot of people moving that way. But it does feel a, a little slow at times. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, of course they they're starting to adapt now because there's so much you know going on and then people are moving that way. Mm-hmm. But you know for me it's like you know everybody like I said that that small close knit family. Um, it's just something that I do love about, you know, having, mm-hmm. coming from a, a small town. But did you know um, that eventually, like, that you were going to, to move away from Arkansas, or was it something that just uh, just suddenly came about? Well, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. Okay. So once I left, I never went back as far as, like, living in Arkansas. So I went to college at Gremlin State University. Shout mm-hmm. out to all the HBCUs, HBC. yeah, so okay? Well. Yeah. <laughs> From there, I moved to Dallas, Texas. Um, I started working for the federal government. So I ended up moving to the DMV, traveled all over the world, went to Texas, and then ended up in Burbank, California. We're going to go back just one second. So you went to you know, Grandma State. Talk a little bit about that HBCU experience because I didn't go to an HBCU. My, one of my best friends, he went to an HBCU. He went to South Carolina State. And I remember my freshman year, my freshman and sophomore year, um, I went down to homecoming, mm-hmm. and the homecoming was like mm-hmm. a, a big family reunion, and it was we had a ball. And my my daughter's mother, she actually um she actually went, I actually met her at homecoming mm-hmm. when I went down there for my um, with my friend. But it was just like the the overall experience of it, it was just like nothing like a HBCU. So talk a little about a bit about that HBCU experience. I would say attending Grambling State University was probably one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, Gremlin grew me up and then being around nothing but black excellence. Mm-hmm. You know, you have so many great people come to your university, talk to you about their different accomplishments. So, you know, sometimes in life we have to see things in order to believe that we can right. achieve it. So attending that HBCU, I loved it. I loved everything about it. And let's go to homecoming. Now, I did it homecoming this year. Homecoming was lit. It was. <laughs> I haven't been in a while, but it, it was my sorority, my line's 20th anniversary. So okay. we kicked it this year. Were you educated and aware of like the, the culture and the history of behind HBCU? Because like for me, I didn't really mm-hmm. I've heard of South Carolina State and I heard about HBCU, but I didn't really understand the impact and like the importance. So were you aware of it before you went there? I was not. So where I attended um, high school, um, it was a predominantly white high school. It was 10 black students in my class. So we really didn't talk about HBCUs. Mm-hmm. The way I found out about Gremlin is I was watching a Tampax commercial and Gremlin dancers was dancing. And I used to dance. I was like, I'd rather go to Gremlin. But originally it was going to be Spelman, but I ended up choosing Gremlin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, what was that like? You know, was, was family like supportive of that decision of going to, a, to a HBCU because it's it's a great thing but it's like uh, sometimes because I didn't 
to me, it, it always felt like, because um, I always hear things about, you know, HBCU not being accredited and, every, and everything like that. And it's like, you sure you want to go to a school like that? But like I said, overall, I, I didn't understand like the history behind it as well. But did you say your family was like, like truly supportive of that decision? Absolutely, my family was very supportive because, like I said, I was the first person to go to college in my right. family. You know, we love Grambling, they love UAPB, so yeah, very supportive. So going from a, a predominantly white school and then transition to HBCU, talk about like how that was like a culture shock when you when you transitioned. So it wasn't a culture shock because I'm like, my family is black. So I've been around black folks my whole mm-hmm. life. But it's going from having 10 black people in your class to, I mean, like black excellence. Because mm-hmm. everybody around you, they're there to achieve a goal, which is to get that degree. So you got friends that, you know, getting ready to go to med school. So you got your doctors, mm-hmm. you got your nurses, you got your computer science major. You got people that's just out there doing great things. And coming from high school, you know, like I say, it was the 10 of us going somewhere where it's thousands of people, you mm-hmm. know, doing great things that look like you. Did it take time to adapt to that freedom? Because I tell people now, it's like, it's totally different when you have that structure at home and your parents wake you up and make you go to class, but then when you go to college, you're on your own, nobody's waking you up, making you do anything. Like, if you don't do your work, that's it's all on you at the time. Was that, was that something that, um, that you had to take a, a, lot, a lot of adjustment to? So I've always been responsible and like very driven. So getting up, going to class, I did that, no issues. Um, but I did normal college stuff. I was up there partying and living my best yeah. life, but I did have the business in the classroom. Absolutely. Speaking about your family, did you did you come from a family of entrepreneurs or, or were they just traditional like nine to five workers? Traditional nine to five. Most of mm-hmm. them worked two jobs most of my life. So, but yeah, we got a lot of entrepreneurs now. You know, people out there. Um, t-shirt businesses, barbers, all kind of things now. But originally, not in fact. What type of um, things did, would you say that your family, you know, instilled in you from the beginning, you know, growing up as a child? Growing up, it's hard work. Because I always watched them get out there and get it. It wasn't asking for handouts. You know, if they had to work two jobs, they was working two jobs to make sure that they met ends meet. So definitely hard working. From high school into college, did you know what it was that you wanted to do or were you still you know, trying to figure it out as you, you know, progressed through school? So I knew that I wanted to do something in theater. So when I got to Gremlin, I was originally going to major in accounting, but I was also working in the theater department to get a fee waiver. Mm-hmm. And then I took a psychology class. I was like, I'm a major in psychology. So from that point on, it was all about psychology. So I was kind of trying to figure things out. I didn't know for sure exactly what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, on blackbusiness.com, it said that you saw, uh, you didn't, see, it was not a lot of black barber dogs on the set, shelves. So, you know, just growing up being in Arkansas, did you think that it was normal when you didn't see a lot of those dogs? And like, when did that, that process of you start uh, taking that notice and stuff? So to me, it was normal to go in the store and see 20, you know, white dogs and maybe one black one. Mm-hmm. So I didn't even think that it was an issue until I got older, but then I realized, hey, what's happening here? Mm-hmm. You know, everybody should be able to see themselves right. represented, but if the store is just showing you one thing, you really don't know that that's an issue until, you know, somebody kind of brings it to light. Like, wait a minute, why is this not balanced? I I was the same way with well, my sister. She had dogs, but I didn't really, really notice it like that. Like, I didn't, you just saw like white barber dogs mm-hmm. or even commercials. Like when it had something to do with, you know, with hair care products, mm-hmm. it was mainly like catered towards a, a white audience, mm-hmm. people that didn't look like us. And when you when you say that, but did you did you ever did you question like your, your family or anybody else about that? I know you say you noticed it, but is, was that something that you started questioning like as a child or was it eventually like as you got older? It's like when I got older, because in the child that was a norm. Mm-hmm. So you didn't even think anything was wrong with it. But like I said, once you became adult, you're like, wait a minute, this should be more balanced. Like every, you know, child should be able to see themselves represented, dolls, protagonists in books and animation and things. Why is this not more balanced? Mm-hmm. So so when did all of this all of it come about? Was it um, you know, doing the, the um, theater in, in, in college? Um which so which one was this what you said was first? Was it the the, the dolls or the, the, the playwright? Which one actually 
The plays yeah. came first because I started writing in high school. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's how I got introduced to theater. Okay. And then, so after after college, would you say that was when the, the dogs finally started coming about? Like, how, how did they go hand in hand? Okay. So the first was theater. So high school, then start working in theater mm-hmm. um, to get that fee waiver. And then around 2012, that's when I founded Black Girls Productions. So it was touring around doing plays. Mm-hmm. And then 2020, I kind of had the idea to come up with a doll. You know, starting a doll on is very expensive. So I was like, let me save a little bit. Let me get this going. But all of that came from my little niece. She always loved a good bedtime story. So I was like, let me write her a bedtime story. Mm-hmm. So I wrote a book called The Adventures of Sugar Mom. And I used to get a lot of DMs from parents. Hey, I read this book to my child every night. And I was like, hmm. How can I come up with a physical version of Sugar Mama to where people can have it in their household? And that's how I started the process of the doll. Mm-hmm. And then as I started that, you know, people were interviewing me. Hey, it was no black dolls, you know, on the shelves, maybe one when I was growing up. And I was like, we all share the same story. Mm-hmm. You know, let me keep pushing. Let yeah. me keep going with this. Because I was like, okay, this is something I need to be pursuing. So were you already... Out here in LA at the time, or like, where were you staying? Like, when when you um, when the dog, when you did the books and the dog. So with the books and the dogs, I was already here. Okay, and the playwright. Did you? So after college, I guess after you graduated from Grambling, I know you said you lived in most places. Like, what was that next move after? Um, after Grambling. After Grambling. Mm-hmm. So after Grambling, I moved to Dallas, and I was working on my master's okay. at Dallas Baptist University. So, so the name, like, how did you come up with the name um, of the dogs? Like, what's the, like, for you, what's, like, the meaning behind it? So, my niece that inspired the doll, her nickname is Sugar Mom. Sugar Mom. So, the book series is all about Sugar Mom, the adventures of Sugar Mom. Sugar Mom saves Christmas and the Sugar Mama doll. So, mm-hmm. she was the inspiration behind the name. Did you feel like moving out here to L.A., like, that was a, a necessary move for a um, of course, for playwriting, but also just from business-wise and, you know, building your, your brand, that was, like, the necessary move for you to come out here. So, the year prior to that, I had, like, a lot of health issues, um, ended up having uh, multiple breast surgeries, um, mm-hmm. dealing with an ankle almost broke, but just a lot of stuff was going wrong, mm-hmm. and around the end of 2018, 2019, so I started praying. You know, I was like, God, what am I supposed to be doing right now? And I kept getting the message of move. So I was like, okay, move, where do I move to? Do I move back to the east? That's where all my family, my friends are. Or do I move to the west coast? And God said, go west. And so that's how I ended up coming out here. Mm-hmm. So when I came to the west coast, it was like right when COVID hit. So everything had slowed down. So my creative process was going. And that's how I came up with the dolls and the books and different things like that. And that was, yeah, the COVID, COVID especially in California, their laws were a, a lot more right. strict. And to, and that, and what I really admire about it is, you know, in the midst of all of that chaos, you still, you know, stepped out on faith and, and moved out here with everything going on. Did you already have a, a plan in mind where you all uh, had a job or anything lined up just to make ends meet when you came out here? Or was it just, um, just you know, just focusing just solely on your business? I had everything lined up. Because when mm-hmm. God said go west, everything just happened. Mm-hmm. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How does, do you ever get homesick at times, you know, being, you know, so far away from your family? Like, how, how is that for you? I do not get homesick. Somebody is always here visiting. So. <laughs> and I travel a lot. So I see them sometimes they go on trips with me. If we're doing a doll show or some type of book event, somebody will be there. How does your family, you know, view you now? Because I know you say in the beginning um, they were pretty much traditional nine to five workers, but now, like, for them to just see your vision and, and what you built, like, how do they view you now as like a as, as an entrepreneur and of course as, as a college graduate as well? They love it. They love it. They're very supportive, and it encourages them to get out there and pursue their dreams too. Mm-hmm. What kind of what would you say growing up? Did you have a uh, would you say you had a mentor or somebody that kind of like took you under their wings as far as like uh, from just a life standpoint and education and, and business? Um, did you have a, a mentor in those fields? I did not. It was just like filling things out and kind of finding my own way. Mm-hmm. 
So talk a little bit about diving into the process, you know, of, um, of the barber dog, like finding like the right products or the manufacturer. Like was how much um, research and um, detail went into that process and was it easy trying to find find what you needed for um, the business? So it was a lot of work. So it started from a sketch. Once I got the sketch down, I had to find someone to produce um, the prototype. So once I got the prototype, I made some changes. So I had to find like a company that could actually produce the dogs. So they don't have any companies like that in the United States. So everybody get their dogs produced in China. So I had to go through all these different companies until I found one that I thought was legit, found one that you know did things the right way. And then that's how I landed up with that company. But the whole process took me about two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. Have you tried getting the dogs into like more like retail stores or anything? I, I, I would assume that that's a very strenuous process as well, trying to get them in, into, the, into the stores. So the thing with retailers is they want to see numbers. So my goal was to sell you know, a lot of things on my website. So when I go in and present, they can see, hey, she's already did the work. Because mm -hmm. they don't want to be just your only source of income. They want to see that you're already out there selling um, product. So that's my goal for 2024. Because I have a new line of dolls that's coming out. So I want to pitch them to stores then. Because now I have the numbers. Did you feel like, you know, being a, a black-owned business owner and, you know, creating black dolls, did you feel like it, or have you been facing kind of like pushback, you know, being this black-owned market dolls? Like I said, it's a... It's a unique space to be in, and like I said, we already don't see a lot of it out here um, as far as like the representation. Did you feel like there was any type of um, pushback, you know, with black dogs? Absolutely, and sometimes from, from black people. Mm. Like, so when I create dogs, I want them to be realistic of us. Because as black people, we don't all look the same. We're not all the same yeah. skin color. We don't all have the same features. So with the sugar mama doll, I designed that doll like based off my niece. My niece is dark skin. So when she see that doll, I want her to be able to see herself. But some people had an issue with it. Why is that doll so dark? Why does that doll look like this? My mom was trying to sell, you know, the doll to one of her friends, somebody she worked with. And the lady was like, well, my child is biracial. I don't want to play with black dolls. So, yeah, you get a lot of, like, crazy stuff from people. Well, so why do you think it's pushbacks? I mean, I can see it. Well, I, I don't see, I couldn't see it, um, but you will understand it more for people that don't look like us, but when it's our own people, like, why do you think it's so much pushback um, that you might see from our own people, being that it's a dog that's, that's more relatable to us, why do you think that is that you see that type of um, pushback at times? I think sometimes it's like a, a lack of self-love, like, mm -hmm. love yourself, I don't care what color your skin is, how you build up, just love yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, but no, I'm I'm, I'm gonna get upset because of, because of a dog. You know, so that right. shows me you got some more stuff going on. Yeah. For me, you know, I, I love the, the representation. I say I have two daughters, and you know, they have dogs of, of all colors. Mm -hmm. But for me, you know, it's important for them to see a barber dog that that's, that looks like them because mm -hmm. I want you to say black is beautiful. I don't want you to think because you know. It's um, like a white barber dog or something that is like a representation that they're greater than you or anything like that. So it's so important. So I've been, you know, very intentional, even with, with Christmas right around the corner. Um, I make sure I told their mom, like, just so you know, I'm making sure I have, they got different dogs. But of course, I'm always getting some, some black barber dogs because I want my babies to see somebody that looks like them. So for you, why, why is that representation so important to you as well? It's very important because, again, sometimes you have to see things in order to believe mm -hmm. that you can achieve that. And you got to realize, you know, I matter too. So when mm -hmm. I walk in the store, I should see something that looks like me. You know, I should see something that represents me, something that's in, you know, a positive light. Mm -hmm. So that's why representation is important. So at this moment, how many uh, different dolls um, do you have, like different types of dolls that, that you have at this moment? So right now we have our sugar mama doll. Oh, and, and excuse me, sorry to cut you off. We do have a doll. If you want to put it on the camera, I'm going to let you, you know, okay. go ahead and you can hold the doll right. up. Please go ahead and show. All right. So this is our first doll that we actually created, which was the sugar mama doll. So she's her own little superhero. So she comes with her little apron dress. And then up under here is her superhero outfit. 
So when the superhero outfit come on, that's when she's about to get down and, you know, have some business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have this doll. We also have a couple of dolls that we do wholesale. A couple of other black dolls. So right now we are completely sold out for the holidays. Shout and out to gonna, everybody. We was going to ask that too. <laughs> we were just talking about that on the way over here. We said, man, we're going to try to get some dolls and, and see if you have any. Yeah. Shout out to everybody who supported us these, you know, through the holidays. We appreciate it. And so right now we're working on three more dolls. There'll be three different shades of Black is Beautiful. So the dolls are Zoe, and that's named after my niece, um, Kinsley, which is my goddaughter, and Brittany, which is my younger sister. So that's our new line that's coming out 2024. How does that feel? You know, of course, you know, it's always going to be ups and downs with the business, but just mm -hmm. to see people, um, Come out and support it. Now you say we sold out for the holiday. And unfortunately, we can't. We won't be able to get one at the moment. But how does that feel to to have that type of support? It feels good because you know technically we're still a small business, mm -hmm. and the fact that people are believing in our products and supporting, you know, my vision. Because one of the things I do too is I give back. So we donated a whole lot of dollars. We recently donated some dollars to the foster care system. Um, we did two nonprofits, one in Alabama, one in Richmond, Virginia. And then last year we did the Shop with the Cop and um, collaborated with a mega church. So we've donated about $130 now. For you, you know, with the business, and we talk about this a lot in entrepreneurship, would you say your, your supporters have been more strangers than the people that you know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like people from all over the world have been buying mm -hmm. dogs. And, and why do you think, you know, we, we talk about it and everybody has their own opinion on it, but why do you think at times, you know, a lot of times the, the people that you don't know are the ones that support you more than the people that you may know at times? Even though at times, you know, your family, friends, they support you. Um, some people in your, your area, your hometown, they may, uh, at times they may not support you, but why do you think at times it's those strangers that put your name and your brand in different places and support you more than sometimes those people that you know. I always tell people, find your market. Your market just may not be your family or your friends. Mm -hmm. Find the people who are looking for whatever product it is that you have, mm -hmm. you know. Because sometimes people, when they first start out, they expect for all their family members to support them, all mm -hmm. their friends, and that's just, you know, not the case. Right. And it could be for a variety of reasons. Sometimes people don't want to see you doing, you know, they want to see you doing good, but not better no. than them. Yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. they just genuinely may not need that product. So I always say find your market. Mm -hmm. No, I think you see, like you said, times they don't they don't want you to see them doing better than you. And then at time it'll it'll be times where like I I created shirts in the past and I I'll make some and I'm like, yeah man, I'm gonna oh, get your shirt, get a shirt for me. Then when you make it, you make the shirt and have it ready for them sometimes they just don't even come back in and pick it up. But then you just can't you have to learn to like not take those things um personally. Mm -hmm. How do you handle, you know, criticism or or um or People come back and give you like advice. Do you do you take do you try not to take that stuff personally? Like if it's something like you said, some people told you they didn't like the dogs because they were too dark. Like how does it make you feel? How do you handle it when you when you get that those type of things? So I have very thick skin. You know I don't really care what people say because I'm gonna keep making dogs, keep producing dogs. Just think about how our life would be if we cared about what people said about us all the right. time. Like you'd be driving crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how many? How many old books in total do you have? So we have three picture books and two coloring books. And are they, you said they were correct if I'm wrong, based around the dogs? So they go hand in hand? Mm -hmm. So you, we got um, The Adventures of Sugar Mama, mm -hmm. okay. Sugar Mama Saves Christmas, and then Amina Fairy and Training, which teaches young kids how not to give up on their dreams. So this is the original Sugar Mama. Sugar Mama. And then we have Sugar Mama Saves Christmas. She got to find that missing Christmas tree. Yeah, right. <laughs> and Amina Fairy in training. So again, it's about a teeny tiny fairy who wants to be a big fairy and she keeps getting overlooked. But she doesn't give up. She keeps practicing and practicing and practicing. And so her number is called and then now she's a fairy. The, so are the, are the books still available if people want to purchase mm -hmm. those? Yes, we have books available and we have some sugar mama dolls available. Everything else is sold out. Okay, and I was going to say, when, so it's around next year when you plan to get more back in, in stock? 
Yes, because we're working on that new line right now. So right now, that's our main focus is getting that new line created and off the ground. So with the playwright, was that off uh, automatic like thing that you said with you know writing plays? Did you make that like a hand in hand with the um, with the dog? Like you just knew automatically you were gonna write a book to kind of like build a story like around on the dog? Is that something that you already had planned out as well? Yes, because I was thinking about books, I was thinking about puzzles, I was mm -hmm. thinking about coloring books, just having, you know, products and things to go with the doll. So each one I want to have, you know, different things that people can buy. So with the next set of doll, like, it's going to be like a sweatshirt line, because it's going to be a Brady girl, it's going to be kind of a jazzy Perfect. sweatshirt. Mm -hmm. So the kids will also be able to have, you know, their Brady girl sweatshirt too, so. Do you plan on potentially doing like an animation series around the dog, or, or, or maybe you, you might already have something like that already done? Is that something that's in the works as well? Something that's in the works. So we want to start off with the superhero, but she her own character, mm -hmm. and then continue from there. That's perfect. I, I think it's just so important though, just to have like a like I said, a lot of time, even with superheroes. They don't look like us, mm -hmm. and we're, we're already portrayed in a, in a negative way at times. And I remember, like, one of the main, it's, it's been some hip superheroes, but, like, the main one that I really, really remember, like, everybody really coming out to support, really, was Black Panther. That's it right there. That was it. That mm -hmm. was the main one that people just really came, went out and supported. And, I mean, I love what it did. Like, you saw a lot of people, like, I don't know how it was here, but back home, when the movie came out, you would see people in Dashiki yeah. at, at the movie theater <laughs> yes. going out going out to support it but i think it's just you know we need to see more like i said it's just that that representation you know having people like see the dog seeing superheroes like um you don't have to portray us always in a negative manner or right. just like as an athlete or entertainer we can do so much more than that. like we can be a, a superhero as well and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. i remember um one of my co-workers um he uh just like with uh, just like the the thing with the, the Little Mermaid when they came out, mm -hmm. um, they weren't used to seeing that, so it kind of like rubbed in the wrong way to see yeah. the Little Mermaid. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, man, what's what's wrong with it? Right. But I think it's just you know just that that mind frame of like, I guess I'll say put it this way, like white is better than mm -hmm. you know black for some reason for right. whatever reason, and it's like it's all it's like they put them on the pedestal. It's like nobody's greater than us. We've created so much more already as, as as African Americans, but their representation is just like I said, just so important. And we got a few more questions, and, and we'll get ready to wrap it up. Um, for as far as the Black Girl Production, can you tell us like how long have you actually? I know you say you, you went you were doing it in school, but how long have you been doing the um plays? So Black Girls Productions, I founded it in two thousand and twelve. Two thousand. In twelve, yes. Where does the the inspiration for your your plays come from? So me, it's life in general. So I try to use theater and film to bring awareness to the social issues and different things that's going on throughout the world. So now, in addition to plays, we have short films, and I also host a love letters to the black man event. Okay. So we had our first one, two thousand nineteen, in Houston, and then I had one this year in North Hollywood, California. So 2024, I'm going to host it in Inglewood, California. Mm. How do you find your location for those? Do you just re reach out to the venues or they, they come to you when they see your work? Like, how do you pick out your locations where you want to do your event? So I reach out to the venues. So I go around and look at different venues and see what feels right. You know, what kind of space do I need mm -hmm. for this vision that I have? This part, I'm, I'm not too... For me, well, I'm not educated on enough, so I wanted to ask you because I, I remember seeing like the uh, the writers' strikes and and everything that was going on over here. Like, how did did that impact you in any way? So that did not because I do everything like independently. Mm -hmm. But it also affected me too because I saw this every day. And you know, everyone deserves to get paid a fair living wage, and everyone deserves to be protected against AI. So with so many different things going on in those contracts that they were fighting for, that I agree, you should have been fighting for that. So can you, can you break that down a little bit, a little bit of like, what, what necessarily was it about? So pretty much it was about pay, and I know, I think I seen one part about like the AI part was like, they were saying like, they would just take like the image of, image of likeness or whatever of an, of an actor or actress, and they would use it in the film, and they wouldn't get paid or something. Was that kind of what it was about? 
So that was some of the things that was going on. Um, they were saying like, hey, for example, you want to be a background actor. So now you're a background actor. They, they have your likeness forever. You won't get paid for that after that, you know, with AI. So those were some of the things that people were complaining about. And I'm like, if they do, if that's true, and they do use people likeness, you should get paid every single time. Exactly. You see yourself in a commercial or a film or something like that. But that's one of the big things that they were complaining about. Was that something that... Did the strike? Was that? Did it happen? Has it been like a year or so? Like how? I, I think it, it's ended now. Am I correct? Yes, it's ended now. But I think it, it may have been like six months, eight months. It was a while. Okay, because I, I didn't. I got. I saw it going on, and they were on strike. But I didn't know like if it impacted you. So as long as you were like independent, you could do. You could do your own. You could still shoot. And I think they were like, they couldn't do interviews and stuff like that as well. Like, and yes, they were, it was a lot of guidelines of things that they could not do. I just wasn't aware of like the the significance of it at all. Like, I guess they, it was so you were still shooting during that time as well? So during that time, I was still um, planning my event because I had the love of the Black Man event um, come up. Mm -hmm. And then I was prepping for a stage play, I'll be singing before I settle that we had in November. So I was still working and still getting things done. Well, did you feel like, is that a time where you can kind of like take advantage of those opportunities? Like where you, when everybody else going on strike and you were still able to create work and that, did you feel like that was the time, you know, take advantage of the market that you're in with um, production? I still right. did everything the same because I definitely supported the movement. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was still doing everything the same. It did not interfere with anything that they had going on. So plays, films, like how many um have you have you created like in total? Plays a lot. Because mm -hmm. I've been writing plays for a long time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of plays. Um we did two short films and that was me kind of learning the ins and outs of film. Um right now we're in the early stages of writing a pilot um episode. And then from there, I eventually want to do like a Christmas, like a full length Christmas movie because this is my season. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> love. I love seeing those. Um, even they even have them on YouTube. You see those uh those black um Christmas movies with black actors. Now, I love seeing it. Um, I think the latest one I just saw watched was uh of course I watched the one with Eddie Murphy, mm -hmm. um, I saw that one. Candy Cane Lane, mm -hmm. and then it was one when I was um. My, well, my daughter's it was one called Cooking Up Christmas. Mm -hmm. I watched that one as well, but it was it was a really that was a really good one as well. Um, so what goes into you know you know creating a film like what's like kind of like the the behind the scenes work and like far as like going into the casting like how did all that go about? So you start off with a script. You got to find that perfect script. Like get a script or you go write a script. Um, from there, start to set a budget. From the budget, start lining up the team, producer, directors, actors, sound, uh, director of photography, start lining up everything, mm -hmm. and then scouting out locations. Do you have those people in mind um, for those type of things, or do you just you go online and like just, you know people in that field already that you go reach out to for those, for those type of things? Yes, I know people already. So people I work with in the past, like people I really like working with, I continue to work with those people. You'll see them over and over again. Mm -hmm. And how does that feel, you know, to work with those people and they they're willing to take the time because they they trust your vision? Like how 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 does that feel, you know, for them to continue to like follow behind you with your foot? It feels good because I know if somebody don't like you, they won't work with you. But when I, I got people like in my plays. Somebody who started with me in 2012, she was just in my play in November. Oh, so she's been with me the whole way, so, yeah. As an entrepreneur, do you still, do you have moments, um, if things don't go your way, will you still have, like, have moments of, of doubt or will you make question things? Because you are human, we all have emotions, we go through things. Do you ever have those moments where you may have like a down moment and you question things at times? I always take things as like a lesson. I mean, like, I should have did this differently. This is a lesson learned. Let me try it this way next time. Like, up until COVID, like, we're selling our shows everywhere. COVID hit, you know, we calmed down, we took everything smoothed out. And then, like, the show we had in November, we didn't have a huge crowd there. You know, so you're going from selling out to now you're producing your first play on the West Coast, and it's not a huge crowd. So now you got to regroup. Mm -hmm. What can I do differently? You know, how can I tap into this market? You know, so sometimes you just gotta, you know, reshift. You can't get hard on yourself. You just learn from it and then move on. 
for you, what would you say is the, the toughest part of, um, of being an entrepreneur? I would say the toughest part is making sure you have good um, time management skills. Because sometimes you can get so caught up on a project, next thing you know, six, seven hours have went by. You still have other things that you need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the time management is, is a big a big part of it, especially if, I would say, um, a lot of times when you, when you, you work a full-time job and, and then you're still trying to build a business, it can be extremely tough because you got X amount of hours of work a week and then when you get off, you may retire and you, you still have to find a way to push yourself to get things done even when you don't want to, um, time management. And then if you do have, to me, one a, a big thing is like if you have a lot of free time, it's like that's what can be scary because now everything is on you. There's no structure like a job tells you um, when you need to be there, when you're on break, when it's time to go home. So when you have that free time, it's it not, none of that. It's like you really have to make the most of that time like, and understand that like, everything that you do is on you. So whether you succeed or you don't, um, how you use that time is going to be very critical to everything that you do. Um, how intentional are you when, when it comes as a, um, a black owned business owner? Black business owner, um, how intentional are you when it comes to you know support the other black owned businesses? Very intentional because we gotta support each other. Because mm -hmm. sometimes people think black owned business businesses and then they automatically have like these negative feelings toward it. I mean, it's black owned. You're still producing good products, good sweatshirts, good food, different things. So I make it a a, a deal to go out. I'm gonna go to a black owned restaurant. I'm about some black owned products. I'm going to go to Target and go to the uh, For the Culture section. I'm going to support you. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's super positive. We have to, to shift that mindset because by the time this interview comes out, we, we'll be, we'll be um, back, in, um, back at home anyway. But the area that we're staying in, um, everybody is like a community and they got everything they need. They got their own grocery stores. Um, they have uh, food set up on different blocks over in, um, in East LA, but everything that they have, like they buy from each other, they got their own shops, and it's like everybody is just supporting one another. There's no, from what we see, nobody just, you know, hating on the next person, mm -hmm. like everybody doing their own thing, but they still go out and support each other. And we were looking for, um, we were looking for some um, barriers, those like tacos that mm -hmm. you that you did. Mm -hmm. So went to a couple of them and they didn't have them, so they they told us they didn't have them and they just recommend us to the next person. You go shop down, right. go down the block and you can get them from there. And it's like, that's the type of thing that I would love to see our community. I'm not saying that we don't do, but I would just love to see us do more of it. Like if it's something that we don't have, point us in the direction to somebody right. who can, you know, help us get what we need. Um, but that's what I'm always intentional about um supporting black owned businesses and it, and and even Tipping them as well, just mm -hmm. giving them something else to just to keep them going because right. it's so hard to, you know, it's one thing to, 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 to make a little profit, but just to stay in business, mm -hmm. it's just so hard to do that. Right. Um, for you, what are some goals that you have going into um to next year um that you can that, that you can open the share as far as like business wise, um finishing out this year and going into next year, what are some other goals you have? So my goals for next year is to again get those dolls lunch to become more of a household brand because people know what Mattel is but I want people to know what Brie and Girl is too. Mm -hmm. So just working on um, branding, like getting the brand out more so people be more familiar with my work and be able to, to give more to. I want to give out at least another two or three hundred dollars next year so I keep giving back to the community so every year I continue to challenge myself to do a little bit more than what I did the year prior. Do you struggle at times trying to like to balance out um, the dogs and the playwright? Is that, do you have a hard time at, um, trying to balance both of them out? Because I know you want to dedicate time to see both of them thrive. Is that kind of hard to balance both of them out? So no, because the dogs kind of sell themselves. So once you got the product created, packaged how you want to, it's kind of like passive income. As long mm -hmm. as people know about the website or we can get them into stores, as long as people can see them, they kind of sell themselves. So the most you have to do with that is just make sure they are in stock. Mm -hmm. Versus playwriting, that takes time. Because you're going to be sitting there with that pen or typing by yourself for hours at a time. So. Mm -hmm. What advice, um, my, five, my five or two questions, for you, um, what advice would you have for someone um, 
that wants to pursue their dreams. Um, whether it's a, maybe it's not playwriting or maybe it's not creating their own um, barber doll line. What advice would you have for someone that wants to pursue their dreams? I would say research, learn the market that you want to work in inside and out, and find a mentor. Like a mentor can save you a lot of heartache, a lot of pain, a lot of money. So do your research, know how to operate that business, and if you can, find a mentor. Absolutely. Mentorship is very key. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't, like when I was in college, I didn't really understand what I was going to do, but once I got into the to the broadcasting space and my mentor took me under his wing, um, that's when I figured out, okay, I can do something like this in the long term. And then he just connected me with other people that were in the media space, and then from there, um, things started rolling a lot more. But mentorship is key, especially when you don't know where you're going, um, just to have somebody that can kind of give you some ideas and just things to like, just try out until you figure out like, where you want to go. My last and final question, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit with us today. The last thing that I love asking everybody, you know, one on the world, traveling, interviewing entrepreneurs and they sharing their journeys. The last thing I love to ask everybody is what does self-investment mean to you? Self-investment means believing in myself. You know, if I really want to get to this certain level of life, I have to invest in myself. I'm going to take some classes, you know, I'm going to um, get in a couple of accelerator programs if I can. You know, I'm going to apply for grants, but I'm going to make sure that I invest in myself because I know if I invest in me, I won't lose. Absolutely. I got to ask you, I just thought about this because earlier, you know, when you were talking about you decided to move out here, mm -hmm. um, you said you spoke to God and asked him where you needed to go and he told you, you know, to go west. How important is faith to you? Very important. I pray about everything. Pray about everything. Mm -hmm. Use the spirit of, you know, discernment. Because I got to know I'm supposed to be working with these people. You know, are these the right people that need to be in my life at this time? So I'm one of those people I pray about everything before I make a decision about it. Absolutely. That's, that's, um, faith is a big part of what I do. Um, I tell people all the time, when we travel the country and interviewing people all over um, and the things that we've accomplished, I'm just like, it's, it's not me, I say. It, it's God working for me. It's, um, Cause I'm, I'm no better than the next person. Mm -hmm. I'm not smart as the most athletic or anything like that. For me, it's just, you just seeing God work through me and mm -hmm. uh, being able to give me a god name platform. Cause I didn't have any of the stuff that you see now, mm -hmm. like with microphones and cameras. Like, the only thing I had was a, was a little small laptop. And just to see like, well, God took me from being back home to all the way across the country being in LA is a blessing. But I tell people, you know, have faith. And I, and I never say, I'm, I'm forcing what I believe on anybody, but I just tell for me, it is God because it's just not me that's mm -hmm. doing all of this mm -hmm. for myself. But Shanisha, I want to thank you again. Oh, I'm saying it's Shanisha. That's I'm right. saying right. Yeah, I keep on making sure I, I don't want to mispronounce your name. I really thank you for taking the time to sit with us, talking about um, Green Girl, Girl Doll Lines, um, Black Girl Productions. Um, Thank you for taking the time to sit with us. Oh, and the, the Black Girl Productions, was that something that you were, and we talked about this as well, is that something that you were afraid of, you know, putting like black girl in the front of like a, a business because you know, having black on or anything, having that attached to it, at times it, it may be an issue? I was going in fearless. I didn't care. Cause I was like, when you see Black Girls Production, you know who's coming. Mm -hmm. So let's put it out there. Absolutely. That's a, Perfect, perfect. Like, don't be ashamed of, it's nothing wrong, don't, never be ashamed of like who you are and what you represent and the right people are going to come with you um, and um, and support you regardless of like what you look like. Anyway. Right. So, Shanisha, thank you for taking the time to sit with us. Before we get out here, can you please um, let everybody know where they can find you? All right. So, if you want information about the Brilliant Girl Black Rose Productions, you can visit our website at www.thebrilliantgirl.com or www.blackgirlswithazproductions.com or follow me on Instagram at black, B-L-K, G-I-R-L-Z, 12. Absolutely. And you still are available. The Sugar Mama Sugar Dives. Mama is mm -hmm. still, still available. We still have the books available as well. So make sure you guys please support. Um, for hope. So hopefully everybody enjoyed this episode of the Cross the Line Podcast. Till next time, keep chasing your dreams. Thank you for listening.